January 6, 1976, Lancaster, Kentucky. Mona Stafford was celebrating her 36th birthday with two of her friends, Elaine Thomas and Louise Smith. The three women drove the 32 miles from their hometown of Liberty to Lancaster to have a nice dinner at the Redwood Restaurant on U.S. Highway 27. The three friends talked about family and the future and the coming bicentennial in six months. They had a nice dinner and conversation. None of the women had anything alcoholic to drink that night. After paying their bill with Elaine and Louise picking up the tab for Mona's dinner, the three women walked out of the restaurant at 11.15 into a chilly Kentucky night. It was 38 degrees and a wind of between 10 to 15 miles per hour. The women bundled their coats against the light wind and hurried to Louise's 1967 Chevy Nova for the trip back to Liberty. Heading out of the parking lot, they proceeded down Highway 27 towards Stanford to Highway 78 for what they assumed would be a nice 45-minute drive home. Little did these women know that this would be a memorable trip, one they would never be able to forget. The women were still talking and laughing as they reached Stanford and made the turn onto Highway 78. Shortly after making that turn in Stanford, the three women saw what they described as a bright red object in the night sky. Mona was nervous that what she was seeing was an airplane on fire and it was moments away from a crash landing. But as the glowing object grew closer, Smith lost control of her car. The Nova was going 85 miles per hour, a speed that Smith was not in the habit of driving. She yelled out, I can't hold it on the road! Mona was in the front passenger seat. She reached over to help with the wheel, believing there was something going screwy with the steering. Her effort did not help. The car barreled down the highway at 85 and Louise noticed her foot was not even on the gas pedal. The instrument panel lights came on, indicating the engine had stalled, and yet they were still moving at a high rate of speed. The object in the sky had moved uncomfortably close. This UFO flew behind the vehicle for a few moments, flipping on its side, and then it pulled up beside the driver's side of the car. All three women were mesmerized by the incredibly large, metallic, disc-shaped object with red lights ringing around the middle of the craft. They also saw a blinking yellow light on the underside. The craft moved ahead of the speeding car. A bluish-white beam of light shot from the craft into the interior compartment of the car. Smith described the light inside the car as sort of like a fog. This fog started to burn their eyes, and they could not keep them open. Tears were streaming down their faces from the irritation. The car slowed and then reversed in a crazy manner into what they later described as a pasture entrance. There was an old stone wall on both sides of this entrance. That was the last thing either of the three remember until they found themselves back in the car traveling toward Liberty again, eight miles further down the road than any of them remembered. They were shaken emotionally and had exposed areas of skin with painful burns. The clock in the car must have been affected by the craziness that happened. It was reading nearly one o'clock. When they arrived at Smith's home, the clock in the kitchen read 1.20 a.m. The 32-mile trip that typically took no more than 45 minutes had taken more than two hours. That couldn't be. There had to be something wrong with that clock, too. They went next door and awakened the neighbor, Lowell Lee. A little stunned to see three women on his doorstep at that hour of the morning, he confirmed that it was indeed well after one in the morning. The women described what had happened to them. Mr. Lee, now more interested than perturbed to be awakened, handed the women pads of paper and had them sketch the object they had seen separately. The three pictures were all exactly alike. The women went back to the house and called the police. A cursory statement was taken by the police, but not much interest was shown in their crazy story. The women were exhausted by their experience and went to bed. The next morning, Smith called the local naval recruitment office. They showed a little more interest in their story, but didn't offer any assistance. But after that call, word started to circulate about the incident, making its way to the local news media. Over the next several days, 
Stafford had problems with her eyes and visited the optometrist and received help for a severe case of conjunctivitis, also known as pink eye. Smith's Chevy Nova had problems with the electrical system, and in a strange twist, Smith said her pet parakeet was now terrified of her, but when others came near, even those who were strangers to the bird, the bird acted normally. She also noticed the minute hand on her watch was spinning uncontrollably around the face. Jerry Black, an investigator with the Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON, heard about the women's encounter and contacted the three women to find out more details. But Smith, Stafford, and Thomas were all reluctant to discuss their night of terror and confusion and didn't have interest in reliving it. It took some persuading, a show of sympathy for their situation and compassion for their experience to convince the women to meet with him. In addition to Black, astronomer J. Allen Hynek of the Center for UFO Studies, or CUFOS, and Jim and Coral Lorenzen, a husband and wife team with the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, or APRO, also began investigating the case. Hynek and the Lorenzens found other individuals in the Casey and Lincoln County areas to independently corroborate seeing an unidentified flying object that night. Within a couple of hundred yards of the alleged abduction, one couple watched from the window of their home and described a large, luminous object which passed over the Stanford area. They noted the time as 11.30. Two teenagers driving around noticed a bright object in the sky and chased it all the way to Danville about 10 miles northwest of Stanford, before losing track of it. They reported what they saw to the local police. Their description was similar to what others saw that night. The farmer who owned the land the abduction apparently took place on noticed a low-flying craft at about 11.30 that shot a beam of light down to the ground. Black, the MUFON investigator, brought along Peggy Schnell, a woman with experience with these kinds of cases, to assist and to help put the women at ease. In the first meeting with Black and Schnell, the women did not reveal much beyond physical pain and a constant, insatiable thirst. They talked a little about the craft itself, like its exterior and how it flew about. Thomas said, We live in fear of what we don't know. I'm worried about Lou and Mona. I think they're ready for a breakdown. Smith showed the two investigators a mark on her neck. Lifting her hair out of the way, she revealed a round pinkish-grayish blotch about the diameter of a half-dollar coin. Black and Schnell both noted the sincerity of each woman along with their bird injuries and Mona's eye problem. The three women were struggling both emotionally and physically. The researchers who had involved themselves with the case agreed to back off and allow the women to recover before releasing any additional information to the media or speak with them about the incident. Despite their physical ailments and emotional state, the researchers all noted these women to be sane, who had apparently witnessed something beyond theirs or anybody else's comprehension. In March of that year, Dr. Leo Spencer of the University of Wyoming flew in to conduct a preliminary hypnotic regression with the three women. Under hypnosis, the three women all revealed the same shocking version of events. During the lost time, they each talked of being brought aboard a ship and then being medically examined by shadowy creatures. After the initial hypnosis session, Mona Stafford was shown pictures of drawings of aliens. Up to this point, the term alien had not been mentioned to either of the three. She flipped through several of the pictures before pausing and dramatically saying, This looks like the light I saw. It was shaped like that head, pointing to a specific alien. Yes, I can see the face now, but it doesn't seem solid. It comes and goes. I mean, fades and reappears like in a fog. Its eyes are far apart and at the bottom. The, the chin is like this drawing. This proclamation by Mona now made it obvious to the investigators they were dealing with an alien abduction case. The next hypnosis session was scheduled for June 23, 1976. Joining the investigators for this session was well-known UFO investigator Bob Pratt of the National Enquirer. Now, listen, I get it. The National Enquirer has an iffy reputation. At this point, the investigation was running low on money, 
what was seen as a highly credible, witness-verified alien contact by MUFON, KUFOS, and APRO researchers. They were looking for a way to fund the investigation, and they reached out to the National Enquirer to help with the funding in exchange for an exclusive story at the end. Pratt was seen as an honest and sincere journalist. James Young, a detective for the Lexington, Kentucky Police Department, was brought in to conduct a polygraph test. Young was recognized as an expert in the polygraph and was a skeptic when it came to UFOs. Young tested the three women separately. After lengthy tests with each of the three women, Young was shocked to discover the women were telling the truth. All three had done well and had not shown any hints of deception. The next day, Dr. Sprinkle conducted two regressive hypnosis sessions with each woman. During the regressions, the faces of the three women showed the emotional turmoil they were enduring. The details of what occurred on that harrowing night came slowly, hauntingly, painfully. Their bodies contorted and writhed about as they provided details of what they remembered about the tests the aliens conducted on them while on board their vessel. The women were subjected to physical examinations, sometimes harsh in nature, sometimes tortuous. There was not any sexual molestation during the abduction, but they were restrained in embarrassing, humiliating positions. Louise Smith revealed that her exam took place on a table. Elaine Thomas was inside of a capsule with an unusual-looking noose-like device around her neck which tightened painfully if she tried to speak. Mona Stafford recalled her exam being in a chair-like device. All of the abductees recalled having their bodies scanned and instruments used which exerted pressure on their limbs. Thomas recalled a tube with a bullet-like tip on it, which probed her chest, and she also recalled a warm liquid being applied to her face and body. Stafford also remembered the warm liquid. The characteristics of the alien forms themselves seemed to be vague and often indescribable. All three related shadowy figures, which floated or glided by them. They also recalled the frightening one eye, or two eyes, which also hovered over them. Stafford made an unusual statement in describing an eye exam. I could see a light at the end of a tunnel, which looked like a volcano with a jagged edge. At this point, she described great pain in her eyes, just like they've been pulled out. Mona recalled a single bright purple eye that radiated lightning-like rays. Elaine also joined the other two in describing the strange events. She remembered two eyes from a round head and a deep darkness. One eye, she said, was a beautiful blue, encircled by a blue membranous lid like a turtle and the other eye appeared dark. Louise saw several different forms of beings during her ordeal, but she was so frightened that she closed her eyes and didn't look at them. However, some months later, she described her vision of the humanoids in similar fashion to her two friends, adding that their hands looked like jagged wingtips. It would be Elaine who recalled the most about her captors, at one point stating, there were several small figures about four feet tall. Each of the three said these creatures communicated telepathically. Not once was an entity mentioned to have any type of mouth. Mona said she could see a square table with a helpless woman on it, surrounded by small figures clad in white. The small beings were closely examining the poor woman. In her own words, I'm not sure if the person was Elaine or Lou or maybe even me. Much was revealed in these sessions, leaving all participants believing that an extraordinary series of events happened on the night of January 6, 1976, in Stanford, Kentucky. The women's stories have never wavered, nor has the belief by many that they were abducted by aliens that night. The Stanford, Kentucky abduction is thought to be the most well-documented abduction case in UFO history.